Hi, I'm Larry Parman with the law firm of Parman and Easterday. Many, many years ago, people started asking me to explain the estate planning process to them. And I quickly learned that sometimes it's best to just be able to outline in very simple terms on one sheet of paper what you need to know about estate planning and how to take steps to get started in that process. So I'm going to share a few of those thoughts with you today and describe on this whiteboard exactly what I sometimes prepare for people on a one-page legal presentation. So we all know that we own assets. So let's just start there. And those assets consist of things like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, mineral interest, real estate property that we might own. It also includes our retirement accounts such as IRAs, life insurance, annuities, and assets like that. Of course, brokerage accounts and checking accounts would also be included. So those assets come to a certain dollar amount. And that dollar amount, the net worth value, is what's includable in our gross estate for estate tax purposes. Now, we also have heirs. We have heirs that we either designate through a last will and testament or a revocable living trust. But if we don't create either one of those, then we might have heirs that are created by the laws of intestate succession within each of our respective states. So let's just put the heirs up here on the board as well. Now, two things can happen to us. We can either live and become incapacitated, or eventually all of us will die. Now, upon our death, those assets start the process of moving toward our heirs, don't they? We know that. We also know, and perhaps you've heard, about a process that's a legal intervention with the transfer of those assets to our heirs. We know that to be the probate process. And probate comes along and it tends to block out the transfer of those assets to our heirs. Probate is a legal court proceeding that does for us what we can no longer do for ourselves. Namely, transfer title to property, of property rather, to our designated beneficiaries. Again, by the will, a last uh, or a revocable living trust, or perhaps the laws of intestate succession. So we have probate that comes along and creates this blockage. Slows down the process. And probate's a problem because it's number one, expensive. It's time consuming. It's a matter of public record. And it's possible that ancillary probates would be required. And by that, we mean probates perhaps in two or three additional states in addition to the state in which you resided at the time of your death. So, for example, if you own the basic part of your property in the state of your residence, but if you inherited a farm from a family member in, say, Missouri or another state compared to where you live, say, Oklahoma, then you're going to have to probate perhaps in two states. If you have a vacation home in Florida, the same might apply. So on the expense side, we oftentimes see fees of anywhere from 2 to 10% on the probate side. Wow, you think, well, that's a lot of money. And why can that occur? Well, you never really know. It depends a lot on the type of assets you own at the time of your death. From a time point of view, it's not unusual for probate to take 18 to 24 months. Some have taken longer. Some of the famous stories that you've heard about, read about in, the, in popular media, such as Elvis Presley's probate, it took 13 years. All probates are a matter of public record, and people don't like that very much. They become very concerned about others knowing all the details and all the intricacies of their financial affairs. So again, a very unpopular component of the estate planning process. So those four issues, the expense side, the time side, the publicity side, and the possible need for an ancillary probate tends to load up the cost of, process, of probate, slows down the process of transferring assets to your heirs, and really frustrates people in the estate planning process. The other issue that comes along, of course, is estate tax. Now, the good news about estate tax today, this being late 2012, is that we currently have a $5 million exemption 
I prefer to use the term exemption as opposed to exclusion, even though that's the technical term used in today's statute, because it more aptly describes what's going on. That basically says that everyone can transfer or give up to $5 million to any one of their choice and do so estate tax-free. Of course, you have, in addition to the federal estate tax, some states have state inheritance tax or state estate tax, and that can only add to the cost of transferring assets to your heirs. Right now, if you exceed that $5 million exemption, the maximum tax rate is 35%. The good news about the estate tax law today is that if you don't use your $5 million exemption, there's a portability clause that says that your spouse can use it at the time of their death if needed. So effectively, a couple can transfer today up to $10 million, federal estate tax free, no problem. Here's the problem. Beginning January 1st, 2013, that $5 million exemption gets reduced to $1 million, and the maximum rate is 55%. That is a huge change. and takes us back to amounts that we haven't seen since 2003, 4, 5. Some of you may even remember when we had a $600,000 exemption. Now, the thing that's important to remember when we're considering estate tax, and this is often overlooked, is that in addition to all of these assets that we talked about being includable in our estate, I left out a very important one that can really cause havoc down here, and that's life insurance. The life insurance death benefit proceeds are also includable in your taxable estate. So sometimes people say, well, gosh, I own a home, I have a, a brokerage account, some retirement funds, and I don't really think I have an estate tax problem because that's about $800,000. And then we find out that they have a $400,000, $800,000 term life policy, and suddenly they're over the estate tax exemption. So all of these factors, the probate factors, the estate tax factors, tend to block this direct movement of assets to your heirs. And instead, what happens is we swing around through this process and we deliver those assets to our heirs through the back door rather than the front door. And sometimes we end up delivering somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of those assets to our heirs. Not a very positive outcome. And then on the lifetime side, as we live to be an older age today, because we have stents and we have bypass surgeries and so forth, all of which are good, we tend to run into other afflictions. We run into Huntington's. We run into Parkinson's issues. We all know about Alzheimer's and all of those problems. All of these cause long-term health care costs. We know, for example, that if we end up in a nursing home, we might spend anywhere from five to $8,000 a month, perhaps even more, to provide the kind of care that we want for ourselves or if we're providing it for a parent, in that case, for them. So at the rate of six, seven, eight thousand $8,000 a month, and keep in mind this is after-tax money, you can quickly end up spending seventy-five, eighty, ninety thousand dollars, and that will quickly deplete a fairly good-sized estate, because we find that the average stay in a nursing home, according to the most recent studies, is in excess of three years. So again, big problems in terms of depleting the estate and managing your assets during lifetime, because we encounter these issues. So here's our point, and here's our plan for you developing an effective estate plan. Do it while you're healthy. Don't procrastinate. Take the time to sit down and work with an experienced estate planning attorney. Be sure you lay out the details of your specific family situation for them so that they can outline a plan to meet your needs. And that plan should include a method by which you can eliminate the probate completely. A plan that should include, if not eliminating, certainly minimizing the estate tax effect and the cost associated with that. Perhaps even more importantly than those two, create documents, create a plan design that will protect you during your lifetime, that will empower out others to act on your behalf, that will clear up confusing points that oftentimes occur when people encounter these dreadful afflictions. That estate plan right here created while you're healthy will allow your assets then to bypass this blockage.
and get delivered straight to your heirs. And if done correctly, you should be able to deliver 95 to 100 percent of those assets unencumbered to the heirs of your choice. So in conclusion, let me touch some of the high points of what we've just spoken about. We know we have assets. We know we have heirs. We know that two things happen to us. We live and we die. At the time of death, all the assets we own start moving toward our heirs, but there's a blockage. Probate gets in the way. Estate taxes get in the way. During our lifetime, we run into the afflictions of Huntington's, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and so forth, and those long-term health care assets and costs can really deplete our estate pretty quickly. So we end up delivering less than the optimum amount to our heirs, sometimes as low as 50% to 80%, when if we'll take the time to create a good estate plan while we're healthy during our lifetime, we can eliminate the probate, minimize if not eliminate the estate tax, address all of these afflictions that we sometimes encounter, and systematically deliver 95 to 100% of our assets to our heirs. That is a much more favorable conclusion and outcome. So we appreciate you listening to this quick overview. It's a good way to start understanding the estate planning process. This is Larry Parman. We'll talk to you later.